Margaret, it's great to be with you. You too, Mr. President. Uh, I don't know if the people listening know our history, but you and I have spent a lot of time together. Indeed we have. And I'm better for it. As I am I. Uh, and we thank Brother Jeb. Yes, we sure do. He's a fine lad. He is, and he's kept the fire burning on education for a long, long time. He, has an, he had an excellent record as governor of Florida, and uh, he is a committed citizen to educational excellence. And for that, uh, Jeb, Margaret, and I are grateful. A uh, little concerned about the name Palooza, <laughs> but it, you know, it, it, it's catchy. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's very modern, Mr. President. It is. Well, I'm not, since I had no idea what it meant. But uh, anyway. Anyway, well, it's terrific to be here. And, and as you say, we have worked together on these issues for a very long time. So I think a lot of people don't know how all of this has come to be. And so let's have a little history lesson here and review uh, your own thinking about being governor of Texas and and the genesis of the nurturing of the policies that became uh, No Child Left Behind. So, t you know, you were governor of a state, a big state, this state here. We're sitting here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, why is education so important to governors? And why well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I first met you uh, because you were involved with education. That's right. And I ran against uh, Ann Richards. Uh, in what seemed a seemingly impossible race because of education. Uh, it first started off, the funding issue was based on the lottery, and yet the lottery was not going to education, which right. was irritating. Yeah. Uh, secondly, there was something amiss in that uh, too many kids weren't learning. And, uh, and then so I made education a key platform I, I thought it was a civil rights issue in that many of the children who weren't learning, uh, didn't, his parents didn't speak English as a first language or were inner city kids. Uh, you and I teamed up to develop a agenda to deal with it. And one of the reasons I won was because we had a positive platform with education as it's one of the focuses, if not the main focus. Now, I used to say education is to a state what national defense is to the federal government, by far the most important priority. And thankfully, I had a group of smart people around me who uh, helped develop a, an accountability system that would determine whether or not schools were working and what children were learning or not learning. And so that was the beginning. Yeah, and, and you talked about, I remember when you met Nelson Brown, the teacher, yeah. HISD social studies teacher who's now gone to glory. Tell that story about, about visiting with him. I remember sharing that story with you because I was so struck by the inadequacies of our education system in Texas. I, I'm moving around the state. Uh, this was a school, uh, inner city school in Houston. And there was a geography teacher named Nelson Brown. Nelson Brown. Yeah. yeah. And I said, it must be great to teach geography in a kind of a throwaway line. He said, it stinks. <laughs> I don't know if he used the word stink, but that's kind of what he meant. Right. And I said, why? He said, my kids can't read. Now, this is a high school teacher. Right. And it, it shocked me. Uh, and therefore, we began to not only focus on accountability, but we also focused on reading. Exactly. Because it became very apparent that the Texas schools were not doing the basics, which is teaching kids to read. Uh, and so under your uh, help, we had a huge reading initiative, and as you recall at the time, there was a debate on whole language versus right. phonics. Still raging, Mr. President. I hear it is, and yeah. uh, and we, we smartly uh, said the best way to determine what works is to measure. Right. Set goals. And if schools are achieving those goals, use the curriculum they're using. If schools aren't achieving those goals, reassess. Right. In other words, the accountability system became a way to kind of adjudicate the debate. Exactly. Between whole language and, uh, and, uh, and uh, phonics. And uh, you know what's amazing, Margaret? It worked. Absolutely. And that became the platform for No Child Left Behind. I remember you, I said that I went to the Bush School of Management because I, you know, it rings in my ear when there are too many goals, there are no goals. Right. And so we had a very laser focused program at the state level and of course at the federal level around accountability and reading and you know those most important things. So right. that got us into discussions about the the federal role and the state role. Right. And those debates still rage on now. And it'll be interesting. Here we are post election, 
to see how that gets calibrated or, yeah. or recalibrated. How do you see the federal role? Well, well before we get to there, uh, one of the things we did uh, uh, was challenge what we called the soft bigotry of low expectations, which basically said, uh, you know, we don't accept the idea that certain kids can't read. Right. In other words, it's, uh, it's prejudicial to consign people to failure. And, uh, uh, and whether that be at the state level or the federal level, the edu people involved in education have to understand that we must raise the sights. Exactly. And have optimistic goals. Uh, uh, to consign a kid to failure is uh, an admission of defeat or an admission of inherent Prejudice. Bigotry. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I was very mindful as governor about the need for local control of schools. And therefore, we prescribed accountability. Right. But said, you chart the path to excellence. Well, it's the same way for the federal government. There is a debate mm -hmm. that says uh, there's no role for the federal government in education. And my response was fine. Defund it. I mean, if, if there is no role, stop funding education. But right. once you do fund... Right. Particularly for poor students, let's determine whether the money we're spending is working. Exactly. And the only way to do that is to measure. Hence, No Child Left Behind basically said, uh, when we spend money, we at the federal level want to know whether or not the states and the districts are achieving significant results so that no child is left behind. Exactly. And, and to get that done, it was your first thing. Uh, as president, I remember the, literally the first week uh, of your presidency, we had five events, you know, every day it seemed like. Uh, talk about what it took to get that big law that affected every single school and community in our country done. Well, the first of all, it, 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 uh, it required surrounding myself with smart people and delegating. Uh, as I recall, you were the domestic policy advisor. I was. That was a high honor. And Lots of uh, I also recall you were the one uh, determining the strategy to achieve a s legislative success. Uh, one of the things I did initially, uh, that w uh, along with Laura, was invite the Kennedys to the White House to see the uh, movie on the Cuban Missile Crisis about Ted Kennedy's brother. Thirteen days. Or Thirteen whatever. days. Yeah. And uh, you might have been there. I was. Okay. It was amazing. It was. And they came and they were very grateful. Yeah. But it was, uh, the reason I tell that anecdote is that uh, legislative success requires a lot of personal diplomacy. And, uh, and we had an objective. And it turned out, we found out that Ted Kennedy had a similar objective. Now, he came about it a different way than we did, but nevertheless, he too wanted the government to be uh, more responsive when it came to making sure children could achieve objectives. And George Miller, Congressman Miller. Miller and Boehner. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, and, people often talk and about... And the great Judd Gregg, was he... Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the big four. Uh, you know, people often talk about the need for bipartisanship, obviously, and outreach to Democrats. But I think what people often overlook in that is that, frankly, you brought people in our party... Yeah. Uh, from places they didn't want to do. There was that kind of abolish the Department of Education yeah. sort of rhetoric and and talk about working with Republicans. Well, you know, uh, it's uh, there's a logic to all that. And I would say exactly what I said earlier. Uh, if you want to abolish. Right. Make sure you totally defund and then go back to your districts <laughs> exactly. and say, reelect me. I defunded uh, money for poor students. Right. I mean, I, I, you know, uh, if that had happened, of course, that would have changed the, the, the need for the federal government to have measured. Right. But it didn't happen. Right. Because it was a political, it was a, a practically impossible. Exactly. And so we made that case. Right. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, when you campaign on a specific agenda uh, and you, you establish that as a priority and you win, whether it be a landslide or not. Right. Nevertheless, uh, our party knew that this was an objective. Absolutely. And our, by the way, in, in, in during the campaign, uh, you, you know, we spent a lot of time selling the idea. Absolutely. I remember going to the NAACP yep. and saying, this is best for you and, and your members. And it wasn't exactly a thunderous applause, but nevertheless, it was a... But groups like Education Trust and yeah. the Civil Rights Community, I mean, we had this coalition of the business community and the Civil Rights Community, right. and God bless Jeb Bush for keeping that kind of 
uh, relationship, uh, you know, underneath all of this reform stuff. By the way, God has blessed you. Uh, yes, He has. Because uh, both of us had great parents. <laughs> yes, yes, you all did. Um, let's talk about what the results of No Child Left Behind were. Sure. Well, in our state of Texas, we had what we call an achievement gap. Yes, sir. Uh, and it was basically, so in order to understand whether or not a reading program works, you have to uh, disaggregate results. In other words, you have to uh, determine success based upon uh, race, right? Uh, geographics, right? And uh, because prior to that, every all the results were lumped together, and, right? You know, Lake Wobegon. Yeah, yeah. Every, <laughs> every school was blue ribbon. Yeah, and, uh, right, exactly. And so, w w once you're able to analyze, it then means the prescription is much easier. And so we had a very, uh, in Texas at least, a very clear view mm -hmm. about the achievement gap. You know, that the white students were here and African-American students here, Latino-American students here. But we were able to measure on a regular basis uh, the, the fact that that gap was closing. Yes, exactly. And we that therefore could go around the state praising educators. Right. Many of whom take a lot of grief at the local level. Right. But we were able to, you know, hold up examples of success. Same at the federal level. And, uh, uh, you know, and the other thing we did was we focused on uh, NAEP. Exactly. Because it meant we could compare across state lines and internationally. Right. I think people don't appreciate what an important reform that was. Yeah. Before you became president, it was about 30-some states and a different 30 each administration. And, you know, now we have this thing that really tells us where we are yeah. uh, all together. Yeah. Uh, not to be a Texas braggadocio, but to remind you, when you were governor, we were in the, you know, mid-30s, or the aftermath of that, the success of, you know, measuring and focusing on reading, and we fell to the m mid to low 40s now yeah, I know in it. our state. I know it. What do you see, what do you make of that? Well, I make that we probably had too many goals. You know, the truth of the matter is, uh, after our time, Margaret, there was too much testing. Yeah. And uh, it's back to what you said earlier, there's so, there's so many goals, there is no goal. Yeah. Well, the goal ought to be simplified again, yeah. and that is to really focus on early reading. Uh, and. Because once you focus on early reading, then all of a sudden, and the kids can read, then all of a sudden it's much easier to achieve, you know, educational excellence. And right. so my view is simplify the testing, explain why testing is important, which is one of the purposes of this conference. Exactly. And refocus the attention of uh, society on things that matter. Right. And what really matters is a kid being able to read at fourth grade. And in ways the public can understand, what your brother has been a major force in driving uh, grade level report cards for states in that name of understandability for parents. Yeah. So a school, B school, not needs improvement, might need improvement, those sort of fungible model, uh, labels that we often see in education. So. No, he's good. Uh, he, you know, he's it's a, been an important reform. It really is. And, uh, you know, part of the education uh, uh, debate focuses on school choice, and I can understand that. Right. And uh, and it must be really frustrating for certain parents not to be able to get their child out of a failed school system. Mm -hmm. But in order to make the case for school choice, you first have to make the case that the accountability system is uh, proves that the school district is not improving. Right. As I like to say, if there's no problem, you don't need a solution. Exactly. Um, so here we are in the middle of a pandemic, or God willing, the tail end of a pandemic. Um, you know, assessment obviously is, you know, upside down now. And a lot of states and districts are doing diagnostic assessments and yeah. whatnot. But how do you see testing in this time, uh, this notion of high stakes testing? What should happen in terms of accountability this year? Well, well first of all, I think that, uh, that because of the disruption of the schools, year that school districts all around the country are going to have to make sure that the, the, the I wouldn't say lack of education, but the lack of educational intensity is made up through uh, the following year. In other words, I don't think we're going to get back to uh, kind of standard until the, there's, there's a catch up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they're going to have to determine, particularly among the younger kids, what has been missed 
and how do we catch back up? Right. And that in itself will require a certain amount of accountability. But it ought, again, it ought not to be multiple tests. It ought to be laser focused on a few things. So I think the reading accountability matters uh, during COVID, post COVID, in terms of making sure that districts are able to catch back up because they're not sure how far their children have fallen behind unless there is some accountability. Exactly. One of, and the early returns are not good. I'm sure you saw in, in, in the recent results here in Dallas. Well, I'm not surprised. Yeah. I mean, you got, you got working moms, yep. you know, whose kids at home kind of self-educating. And uh, secondly, uh, one of the things that we're going to realize after this is over is that children need to have social interaction. Exactly. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're just going to have to catch up and, you know, hopefully this vaccine and will come, come to be in, you know, a year from now, uh, during the Ed Palooza, <laughs> there is a whole different, uh, environment. But one thing is going to be for certain that school districts are still going to have to determine, you know, where their children stand relative to standard. Exactly. One of the things that we're seeing is, uh, you know, a lot of students are missing from the schools. I mean, yeah. our, our enrollment is down here in, here in Texas, and this is holding up around the country, about 6%. I mean, 250,000 kids that were here in the spring are, are gone. I'm not surprised. And so we've got to go find them and help them catch up. Yeah, that's going to be the real challenge. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I don't think you can hold schools to pre-COVID standards until uh, we're head back to normal and give schools a chance to catch up, but they're going to have to measure to determine where they have to catch up. Exactly. So if you're, uh, what advice do you have for governors or, or members of, of state legislatures in this time as they look forward, um, not only to the remediation and the catch up, but the days ahead? We're hear hearing a lot about workforce and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. pathways. Well, I, I think one of the things we're doing at the Bush Center is to make sure people understand that education is necessary a good education necessary for pathway to the workplace. Right. And, uh, but I think that governors uh, should not be intimidated by the accountability debate. <laughs> yeah. Because it can get noisy and loud. On the one hand, you've got, uh, in some places, teachers unions that say, uh, it's unfair to me, the teacher, to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's like, the student is so hard to educate, therefore, I, you shouldn't hold me to account. Uh, that's, uh, in a way, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Right. Uh, on the other hand, you've got parents saying there's no role for testing. Uh, and a governor or a member of the state legislature has to rise above that noise right. and lead. This is an issue that requires strong leadership. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, it's important for governors to prioritize education. And if you prioritize education, I mean, it's, it's by far the biggest funding issue for most states. Absolutely. And therefore, if you're spending money, you know, you need to know. Right. Whether or not the money is uh, effective. I like to say we need to care enough to find out. Exactly. And, you know, it's, I think people have been surprised when, when strong systems of, of reading and literacy coupled with strong accountability in places like Mississippi. Yeah which have done incredible work That's challenging fantastic. the soft yeah. bigotry and low expectations and all that. There's a lot of good examples. Margaret, one of the things we're doing at the Bush Center is we developed this new dashboard. You might want to describe it to, to the Ed Palooza fans. Well, just as you rightly say, you know, measurement and accountability and transparency is so critical. Uh, that's absolutely the case as we think about those transitions from K-12 into post-secondary education and into the workforce. And so just as you all had that great report card for cities and mayors, so now are we looking across the country about how good a job we're doing about connecting our schools into our universities and into the workplace and preparing everyone to be successful there. And so thank you for that. It's next level accountability. It's next level transparency. And, and we at Texas 2036 pledge to partner with you on that as well. And right now it's, it's an abnormal period. Right. But when we get back to a sense of normalcy, uh, you know, I, I know Jeb will keep working. It will keep working the issue at the Bush Center of, of a strong accountability system. In our case, by the way, we're focusing on principles, how to hire, how to find and retain good principles. I used to say, show me a good school and I'll show you a good principal. Show me a good principal, I'll show you a good school. See, that's why we're, we miss you because you're a, perfect, <laughs> you're a billboard. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, and, 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 you know, show me a good leader and I'll show you a good something, right? It's so, it. 
So uh, we talked about the role of states, advice you might have for state policymakers. Uh, what advice do you have for our friends in, in Washington and a new administration and the Congress uh, in terms of federal policy? You know, it's going to be a major focus of funding. It's always a funding fight. Exactly. Yeah. And the question is, is more money going to yield better results? And, you know, history has proven that, that, that money doesn't equal results. Uh, money is important, mm -hmm. but results are achieved through uh, curricula and goals. Yeah, high leverage policy. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned the Bush Center. And yeah. Thank you for continuing to light the fires around these, these issues. Talk about some of the work you're doing well, in education uh, uh, and other. Full disclosure. Yes, sir. You were Secretary of Education. Right. You ran the Bush Center. Yes. Therefore, I have a conflict of interest. Your imprint <laughs> survives, and, uh, and for that we're grateful. Uh, so, what was the question Tell about the work of the Bush Center now? I know you all are doing a lot on data. I know you're working on immigration issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, have yeah. a lot of nexus. Yeah, so the Bush Center is uh, well. Thank you. It's it's broader than education. I right. see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we've done, I th think, will hopefully interest people is that we've teamed up, uh, and, and this was your creation, I might add, teamed up with the Clinton Library, the Bush 41 Library, and the LBJ li li Library to develop a leadership program. Um, men and women from all walks of life, generally younger than me, which is not that hard these days, <laughs> uh, no political party, no b political bias. They're, they're activists in uh, private sector, public sector, care deeply about America, but they come together to form a cohort to study leadership examples, how to be a better leader, mm -hmm. uh, and they case studies at our four respective libraries. Right. Uh, and so that's an ongoing program that's been extraordinarily successful. Uh, we do the same thing for veteran group leaders, in, in part leadership skills from what yeah. we've learned. Uh, we're still focused on uh, helping women on the continent of Africa deal with cervical cancer. Terrific. It's been a very successful program, Absolutely. I might add. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of veterans programs, wellness programs, uh, transition programs. Of democracy. Oh, yeah, yeah, Human yeah, freedom. Course. Yeah, human freedom. That's, I mean, we're, we're uh, not in Freedom Hall, but uh, we have what's called Freedom Hall here because I strongly believe freedom yields peace. Yeah. And so we, we're, you know, spending time with... Uh, uh, helping North Korean escapees, which leads to your initial question. I now remember it. <laughs> Federal policy? No, immigration. <laughs> oh, immigration, yeah. Okay. So, um, Margaret, as you know, I, since I painted your dog. Yes, thank you. I've become a painter. And uh, I've, I've, uh, I've transitioned from pet portrait painter <laughs> to portrait painter. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've painted the... Uh, Portraits of 43 immigrants. Super cool. We chose the number 43 because I happen to be the 43rd president. Uh, to tell their stories, to try to get a rational voice in the immigration debate. The debate has been uh, harsh. Yeah. We worked on that together at the White House. We did. And unfortunately could not get it passed because yeah. of politics. Yeah. Immigration is crucial uh, for our economy, but it's also crucial for our soul. And so as you sit here at your ripe old age and time to paint and think and observe, uh, you know, what, what do you say about our institutions, our democracy? We've just been through a challenging campaign together, no matter where you came down. Yeah, it's challenging, all right, but uh, the number of people who decided to participate was impressive. Uh, it is, uh, democracy is alive and well. It is throughout our history been noisy, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, I think when it's all said and done, people will be able to look back at this period and say, "Thank goodness we had the institutional protections." Yeah. Uh, and so I tell people, the office of president is more important than the occupant. Yeah, you, I remember. You know, we come and go, we presidents. Yeah. We've got our strengths, and we certainly have our weaknesses, but the institution of the presidency protects America in the long term, and I'm, I'm confident it'll happen again. And uh, people of prayer pray for whoever the president is. Absolutely. And uh, I hope people uh, in our country uh, feel the way I feel, which is we want our president to be successful, whoever the person is. That's right. Uh, because when it's all said and done, we're all, we're all Americans. 
Mr. President, thank you. I pray for you and uh, I so appreciate the role that, that I have had in, in, uh, in your administrations and, and our friendship. And so thank you for taking time to visit with us. One more thank you to Brother Jeb. Oh yeah. For continuing to highlight these issues yeah. and uh, we'll see him at the Ed Palooza, maybe in person uh, next year. Perfect, thanks Jeb. All right, thanks Jeb.